By Night in Chile by Roberto Bolaño, translated by Chris Andrews, was the first book that I read this year, and also my first Bolaño. I have not read him. This I remember being good, but not particularly inspiring for me. I remember it being about a priest and a dictator and literature and feelings. I probably won't remember much of it past that by the end of the year. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. My first time reading Villette. Loved Villette. Had such a great time with Villette. So much yearning. Yearning is a consistent theme of my 2024 reading thus far. Disease of Kings, poetry by Anders Carlson Lee. Really good poetry. Pretty meticulous concerning poverty and shame in a way that I thought was really richly explored. Ten Bridges I've Burnt by Brontes Purnell. This is a memoir in verse. I did not find in any way the verse to be advantageous as a form here. It's just a use of compression. It's just a way to make the thoughts shorter. I didn't really feel like it was particularly poetic. But the stories themselves, the actual like memoiristic parts of this text were really, really endearing, really funny, really thoughtful good, like, juicy memoir. The Wounded World by Chad L. Williams, a nice chunky non-fiction that explores a lost manuscript from W.E.B. Du Bois, and Chad Williams reconstructs in many ways that manuscript, which is a history about African Americans in World War I. Beautyland by Marie Helene Bertino, an anticipated five-star read, a five-star read, an alien girl getting faxes, and it's about Carl Sagan and single motherhood and just the bizarreness of humanity, but without skewing sentimental or twee or trite. I, I, I really love the mischievous, ethereal nature of Marie Helene Bertino's writing. I thought that this was just such a lovely read. Filter World by Kyle Cheka. This is a book about how algorithms flatten culture. Kyle Cheka did a book on minimalism that I super enjoyed. I found this to be equally charming and accessible while simultaneously affirming of what I know to be like the dangers of social media and its effects on creativity and uniqueness. Where There Was Fire by John Manuel Arias. This was a lovely, rich, and sensual debut about family secrets and arson. Charming Young Man by Elliot Schrafer. I loved this little YA book. This little YA book has a chance to be on my top 10 books of the year list because I just, I, I clung to it so dearly as I was reading it. It's about Leon de la Fosse who was painted by Sargent and the world of composers and artists during that time in France. And it's so gay and so full of yearning and so floral and lovely and sweet. And I just feel like it fostered a nostalgia for something I've never experienced in me. In One Fell Swoop, I will uh, just say that I read the entire nine book series of the Every Hearted Doorway Wayward Children series. I devoured these books. I loved reading them. They're so surprisingly gruesome and so thoughtful and fun. And while occasionally heavy handed on the character development because they are so short in their novella forms, I think that they really, really work to just inspire the imagination in such a winsome way. Now that I'm caught up, I have to wait the full year to read the next one. And I am grumpy about that. Your Utopia by Bora Chung, translated by Anton Hur. This is Bora Chung's follow-up story collection from Cursed Bunny, which I also loved. I really enjoyed this. The cannibalism story in particular is just so thrilling and funny and just comically bombastic. I really, really liked it. Hours by Philippi Williams, a long novel. I didn't realize how long this book was going to be until I like got a copy in the mail and it was so thick, but it was worth every page. It is a pretty sprawling historical fiction with a huge cast of characters, each with their own individual specific stories centered around a community established to aid in the protection of black people at the end of the Civil War. I think that Philippi Williams as a poet turned novelist has really captured the power of efficient, beautiful metaphor. The Kamigawa Food Detectives by Hisashi Kashiwai, translated by Jesse Kirkwood. This was so cute. This is just sweet little stories about people with the mystery in mind of how to prepare a meal or how a dish was cooked, like a beloved meal in their lives. And this father-daughter duo that run a ramen shop, like, take all the clues from the stories that these people tell and like recreate the meals for them to like solve the mystery. It's not like a mystery in the way that I think people are inclined to think of mysteries, but it is so special and so sweet. Divine Might by Natalie Haynes. Love me some Natalie Haynes. This is kind of a spinoff of her essay collection, Pandora's Jar. It really continues in that vein of taking women from Greek mythology and breaking their stories down 
from all angles, analyzing why these Greek goddesses and creatures were made that way, what parts of religion may have fostered their existence to be as they were, and then how that has gone through to like pop culture today. Root Fractures by Diana Koi Nguyen. This was a lovely poetry collection full of palimpsests and art poems and word poems that have an experimental touch without being convoluted. I thought that this was such an improvement off of her previous collection, Ghost Of. I feel like Ghost Of was kind of lost in the experiment of it all, but here it feels very specific and honed. I feel like in a lot of poetry collections there is a conversation about the bifurcation of life when being a first generation person in America. And because of the oversaturation of that theme and idea, a lot of poetry kind of falls flat when it's about that, because if you have read it, you've read a lot of it, and therefore the overexposure kind of makes you less excited. But here I think we get something a little bit more special, and what she does with regard to Vietnamese history and Vietnamese American history, and specifically like medical trauma and the medical history of their lives is unique and offered a fresh perspective on a frequently recurring theme. Poor Dear by Claire Oshetsky. I loved Chouette. Chouette was a really solid debut. This was not as solid of a sophomore novel. Really gross, traumatic, bizarre experience of like a girl who murders her friend as a child and then just like has PTSD about it. And there's metaphor deeply woven in. It's a very fantastical, like fabulous sort of narrative. And it was fine. The Posthumous Memoirs of Bras Cube Boss by Machado de Assis, translated by Margaret Jewel Costa and Robin Patterson. This kind of rocked my world a little bit. There are two translations currently out, and Perul Segal, in a fantastic review, as she is inclined to do, suggested this one over the other to read. And so I read this one, and I would just say go read her review. What she has to say about this book is exactly what I would want to be able to say about the book, were I eloquent enough. But it's such a bizarre and surreal, fun experience of a man narrating his life out of time as he rides to the afterlife on the back of a giant hippo. Well, it has been so long since I filmed a video, I, I forgot how much I don't like listening to the sound of my own voice. Bite by Bite by Amy Nezakumatafil was something that made me very hungry. It's a meditation on different food. And each chapter, each section of this book is sort of a memoiristic essay or poem or meditation on a different food item in her life, and it was so gorgeous. There were stunning illustrations paired with each item discussed, and it's a beautiful object as a book that I would recommend easily, as a gift to give to people. Then I read Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain in anticipation of reading James by Percival Everett. Those are my next three to discuss. I really don't have anything to say about Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. I don't have like a hot take about them. I think we all kind of know the thing. I found them to be incorrigible. I find that Mark Twain's tone of voice in like the haughtiness that he looks back on childhood to just be like the opposite of endearing. I think it is just so cloying and, and aggravating and pretentious. I have far more thoughts and feelings about James, which is a book that I kind of wish had melted my brain a little bit more given the conversation around it, but I ultimately don't think that was the point of the book. It is a true-to-form Huck Finn retelling. You get all of the staple moments with very little straying. The parts that do stray are actually phenomenal and very funny and thoughtful, and I, I really liked that. It is a very funny book. It is a relatively horrifying book. It's a book that ultimately makes the adventures of part of Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn irrelevant. It's not adventures, it's reality, and it's terrifying. It points out with such clarity the absurdity of Mark Twain creating a dialect for enslaved people, and it runs with that to an extreme. And and there are far smarter people who have talked about this book than me, so go read their reviews instead. But I really enjoyed James. It was not what I expected, but it was still really good. Obviously, we love Percival Everett. Then I read My Documents, which is a story collection by Alejandro Zambra. This is translated by Megan McDowell. I read a lot of Alejandro Zambra. I'm a big fan. This story collection, I believe, was their debut short story collection. And I was so surprised by how homoerotic it was and how unspoken that homoeroticism felt in the lives of these characters, where, like, the stories themselves would be about, you know, coming of age or relationships with dads. It's, it's a lot about, like, probing masculinity and the time period in Chile where it's taking place. But, but then suddenly characters will be like having a romantic encounter or positing ideas of what it would be like to like sleep with one another. And it's out of the blue and it's so gay and then it's just brushed away immediately. 
almost like intrusive thoughts. I found that to be so fascinating, especially with examining masculinity in general. And it was just an odd, lovely queer experience, but also just really rich, thoughtful, interesting stories. Thirst by Marina Yuschuk, please correct my pronunciation down below. Translated by Heather Cleary was a sexy, historical, lesbian vampire novel. Can't go wrong with that. At first I wasn't vibing with it. At first I thought it was a little bit slow, but then partway in it gets like really bloody and angry with God, and I was like, hell yeah, let's do this. Happy by Selena Baljeet Basra is kind of a Pollyanna story. Capitalism has laid claim to its main character's hometown, and he wants to escape, but simultaneously gets caught up in like a transnational trafficking scheme, and all the while tries to maintain his joy and positive outlook. His name is Happy. The metaphors kind of explain themselves. It's a really interesting look about the abuse of migrant workers, but ultimately probably won't leave a lasting impression otherwise on me. But the Girl by Jessica Jean May Yu was lovely and pensive and a neat look at a deeply entrenched literary life. It gets pretty meta with its conversations about like writing a dissertation on Sylvia Plath and what is the nature of writing a post-colonial novel and how does that reflect this main character's relationship to her cultural identity and heritage and nationality. All the World Beside by Gerard Conley, Puritans, Homosexuality, and Yearning, just a wonderful, wonderful novel. Really solid writing that really captures the sort of delicate sensations of wanting another person and the forbiddenness of that, especially during this time. I think that it gets at a lot of really good ideas of the boutiqueness of faith and how people want to find richness in life outside of religious community and how religious community can really limit your ability to thrive and grow and love. No Judgment by Lauren Euler, Lauren Euler's essay collection. You know, I struggle with Lauren Euler because she built a lot of her career off of being a literary pan artist and then put out a very mediocre novel and I think that's kind of a fail. Leading into this essay collection, she published the, the serial of it, which was an essay on anxiety, and it's in this book. It's really lovely. It's a physiological look at how anxiety affects the tension in her jaw and what that means for her life, and this kind of constant reminder, this, this bodily reminder of a, a perpetuated state of heightened brain chemicals that is hard to shake. And because it is so personal, and because she is very quippy and colloquial, it's a lovely read. It's it's a really solid essay. But then she has like cold takes on autofiction and then a really poorly constructed look at expatriate life and kind of makes a lot of excuses for why she deserves Berlin where others don't. And then uh, a Goodreads essay that only uses really one case study and doesn't go very far. The essay on gossip which leads the collection is entertaining, but it talks about how people often misremember things on the internet for their benefit and how that skews perception and how online perpetuates gossip in that way. But then in the Goodreads essay, which follows that essay, she misremembers, perhaps for convenience of writing the essay, review bombing events that have occurred across Goodreads. And I just, I don't know. I, I read this and I won't read any more from this author going forward. We're almost done here. Reading Genesis by Marilyn Robinson. Uh, Marilyn Robinson's the only person who could make me care about the Bible. I finally bought some Jordans by Michael Arsenault, a really funny memoir, really good anecdotes, uh, kind of a nice memento mori. About Uncle by Rebecca Gisler, translated by Jordan Stump. What a weird little book, written in a sort of subject-verb-object simplicity with occasional sprawling sentences about pity and love. The Phoenix Bride by Natasha Siegel, a lovely follow up to her book Solomon's Crown, which I adored. This is another kind of forbidden love story, this time set in the 17th century in London, and it's all about melancholy and plague and fire. It's so, I, I think she's just good. She writes really strong metaphors, really captivating, yearning, again, 
Loving the Yearning this year. And lastly, Wolf at the Table by Adam Rapp. I have read many of Adam Rapp's plays and therefore I kind of mm, sort of expected what I might get going into this book. But this book is like the most sordid, murderous family novel you'll ever read. It's so unsettling, more unsettling than any thriller and more psychologically curious. I, I think that it's so captivating and I kind of loved it. There are many flaws. His treatment of mental illness especially feels incredibly Hollywood and overblown but I really liked watching these characters struggle with bad things happening to them. I loved watching their near brushes with serial killers and sort of Little Red Riding Hood perpetuations in life. It was, it was, it was a fascinating, weird book that I don't recommend, but I really loved. And that's that from me. Um, I'm not really the best at logging what I have read throughout the year, but that's most of what I have read this year. I've read a lot for work that I generally don't talk about on the channel, but I wanted to catch you up on my reading life. Creativity has been a little bit difficult for me as late, and I haven't felt quite inspired to stand in front of a camera, but I'm always active on Instagram. So if you, if you want more up-to-date reading from me, or if you want to look at pictures that I've taken of the iced coffees that I've drunk, um, follow me there. Let me know how you're doing. Let me know what you're reading so far this year. Let me know what you thought of the, the Women's Prize and International Booker Prize long lists. I'm going to read a few off of each. I didn't find them particularly thrilling, but uh, there were some titles that really stuck out to me. If you have any questions, thoughts, comments, opinions, or beliefs about anything else I've mentioned in this video, you can put those below as well. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you soon.